Okay, Thank good you. morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, a webinar, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, uh, and they are recorded, however, so if you're unable to join us live during one of these shows, that's fine. You can go back and watch our years and years, four, something like that now, <laughs> of recordings that are on our website. And we cover anything um, that could possibly, that would be anything library related, we'll put it on the show. Um, book reviews, inter interviews, uh, presentations, mini training sessions, whatever. As long as it has something to do with libraries, we'll have it on the show. Uh, we bring in, bring in guest speakers. We also have speakers, um, presenters from the Library Commission. And as we do this morning. Um, you're in control. Okay. Yep. Um, we have, um, I'll just let you guys introduce yourself and do your thing. Um, we, have, we have book kits, book club kits that we offer here at the Library Commission. We're going to go through how that process works and then some of the titles that are in there. Not all of them. I think we're at, what, 300? 348. <laughs> so you'll hear about all of them, but <laughs> uh, certain ones we'll go through. Deborah, you want to introduce yourself so. and then I'll... And I'm Deborah Drago. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that was Deborah Dragos. I, I am Beth Goble. And I'm Lisa Kelly. And we're all in a book club. So that is the criteria. These aren't just book reviews. These are book reviews that we're reviewing as we've discussed them in a book group. So there's a little different spin on it. And for those of you who are in the state of Nebraska and are in a library or a media center, you are eligible to use our book club kit collection. So here's the rules for use down here, which we'll explain how it all works. Here's a request form when you found a title that you're interested in. Something I also want to point out here is a book club sharing wiki. Other libraries who are willing to share their book club kits are all listed here by title and the number. So if you don't have something, or we don't have something, and you're looking for it, it sure makes it easier than interlibrary loaning 15 copies. So we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, and there is a single alphabetical list here, and then we've broken out the list here. So you've got your discussion questions, and you're good to go. So if you have any questions about it, please just contact us. You can do so in any of the ways we've made available here. And one last thing I do want to point out, we've just added this recent note about what if you have someone in your book group who has a special need with print and is a talking book user? I mean to add these and have not yet, but the Talking Book Library has several of these titles in their collection as well, so you can include those folks in your book club collection, so please keep that in mind. With that, we've, uh, we've got a lot of books to go through, so we'll start with Devra, and give me your title. Okay. Um, I actually belong to two uh, book groups here at the Commission. In one, we generally discuss children's books, and in the other, we discuss adult books, book titles. So I'm going to start with a children's book title called Unwind by Neil Schusterman, which um, a few years ago was the very first book that was chosen, um, yep, 2010, 2012. It was chosen as the yeah. first one book for Nebraska teens. And they did specify that it was for high school students. Um, sometimes when you say teens, you know, the, the younger kids uh, read this. And I'll just start out by telling you, in our book discussion group, there was a very definite um, thought that children's, younger children, should not read this book. <laughs> but, what would be the um, youngest age then? Um, 15. Probably, yeah, 14, 15 maybe at the youngest. Um, it is, it, the story does take place in a future America where parents can have children between the ages of 13 and 18 unwound, which is basically a euphemism for sentencing them to death, after which their organs are harvested, okay? <laughs> um, abortion at, is outlawed. This was a compromise between the pro-life and the um, pro-choice uh, uh, groups after an actual war took place. Okay? In this book, the protagonist is 16, Connor, the main protagonist is 16, when his parents decide to have him unwound. Okay? 
Um, some of the themes in this book, of course, are, okay, the morality of, okay, can you, can you <laughs> basically sentence your child to death? Um, there is the idea that, that some people in this book promote that, well, that person is still alive because each of their parts lives on in another person. Um, but <laughs> are we our physical parts or our, you know, what about your soul, your spirituality? Um, also, another thing, how do you handle children that misbehave or are not <laughs> perfect? Do you say, ah, okay, you, you bet, I've had it, kid. Off you go. That's, you know, you're going to be unwound. Um, survival is another theme in this book. In this case, um, several of the three of the main protagonists, three of the protagonists, actually run away when they're going to be unwound. And they find um, an, an, a group that works underground that takes them to a place where the kids are living and trying to get to an old enough age where they can maybe, you know, go back into society and live a full life. Um, so there's survival, there's justice. Who can you trust? You don't even always know. Um, if you meet somebody and they say they're going to help you, are they really going to help you or are they going to turn you in? Um, the book would definitely benefit, a, a reader would definitely benefit from reading this as part of a group, if, they're, if mm -hmm. they are teenagers, to discuss it. Um, there, are, uh, there are things that a teacher or an adult could um, <clears throat> bring to this book, um, some historical perspective. Okay, how does this relate to how the, the Nazis handled um, groups that they didn't approve of or they didn't like? You know, the eugenics idea, if people weren't perfect, you know, do you just get rid of them? Do you keep them from having children, you know, themselves? Um, coming of age. There are all different kinds of things that are, that are uh, there to talk about. And as I said, we had a very lively discussion and about I, a number of I these topics. I participated in, uh -huh. in that discussion. I'm, I'm not normally in a tent. This is Beth. I'm not normally an attendee in the children's book group discussions, but I wanted to read this one. And yes, um, it was a very lively discussion. A lot of disagreement? Um, some. Some. Um, I guess a lot of what you might call the disagreement was we were disagree disagreeing with the committee that chose the book oh, at, for, for discussion. This, yeah. For uh -huh, relevance. Because there were some people in, the, in our group that were very adamant that they didn't feel yeah. it was appropriate for that age. Well, level. and we had our discussion before the Hunger Games came out, and that has right. become an enormous hit. And there are elements of the same kind of theme as the young people being the sacrificial lambs for society. Mm -hmm. And um, so if, if your young readers enjoyed the Hunger Games, they'd probably enjoy discussing this book too. Okay. Or adults mm -hmm. would enjoy discussing it. Let's move on to Beth. Okay, I'm going to switch gears to, I think it's at the very top of our list. I guess I'd call this an oldie but a goodie. It's All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. And I had never read it, um, and I happened to see it on Lisa's desk when it, and, um, we got the kit. And so I suggested that our uh, group here at NLC read the book, and I believe Deborah participated in that discussion because mm -hmm. I'm hoping it was a few years ago that we well, about two years ago maybe that we talked about it, so my memory is already a bit shaky, but um, you, the rest of you are probably familiar with the book, uh, written in 1956 and won the Pulitzer Prize, and it is based, um, well, the author said not so much, but other people think that it's based quite a bit on the life of Huey Long, who was governor mm -hmm. of Louisiana and was assassinated in the 40s, and I think this would be a great book for an adult book group discussion um, because of the themes involved. The quality of the writing is exceptional. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit confusing at times. It switches focus between a narrator who's a young man who goes to work for, Willie Stark is the name of, of the Huey Long character. But uh, what I found really fascinating was the, the character of both Willie and the young man, whose name has gone right out of my head, and I can't remember, but whatever. <laughs> um, as time goes on, you know, there's that old adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and you can see that transition taking place as you read through the book. 
and the young man who starts out as really just wanting, I think, to find out more about um, Willie kind of becomes more like Willie as time goes on, and it costs him. There's a huge cost in his life. He, the woman he loves really parts ways with him over it, and there's also a, an element of mystery in it about the young man's own background, um, which is kind of interesting. So if, if you're in a book group where people aren't afraid of social political commentary, this would be a great one, um, talking about the morality of, of power and how it corrupts. In your book group, was kind of half and half on that one, if I recall. Half liked, half didn't mm -hmm. really like it. Is that correct? Um, yes. Two, two of us had already had read it before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one male member of our NLC group, and he felt that this was probably the best book we had discussed all year. <laughs> and he uh, was unfortunately unable to attend the day we talked about it, but he provided us with some notes. That was one of Very was. detailed uh -huh. notes, which was wonderful. Some, some people really loved the way he used language, and there were others who said, okay, this whole paragraph is one sentence. <laughs> it runs on forever. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that is an important. It's not a short book either. It is uh, over six hundred pages. Way, uh, school of writing, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Terrific use of words. So, if your group isn't up for a six six hundred and fifty page book, that would be a consideration. Then there. Our particular copies don't have discussion questions in the back, but as you can see from the website, yeah, are, they are available. We do have some here. So I would recommend it to a group that's ready to tuck into something a little bit more challenging, but with plenty to talk about. Okay. I'm going to bring the mood down some. Um, we just checked this out to a library, and I was grateful to see it go out. I, I know that it's this, uh, At Home at Midford by Jan Karen, who's been around for a while. Uh, might be considered Christian fiction or a woman's book, but um, I know that she has male readers, and it is a series. This is the first in the series, and I wanted to just point out that some of us at work read it one winter together. I had it had, been, it had long been on my list to read, and so I got the readers' advisors to read it. And if your book group is really about food, there's a lot of food in this book, and so we all assigned each other a recipe. There was. Um, let me make sure. Father, I made Father Tim's ham. Kay brought Russell Jack's liver mush. Uh, Sarah made Esther's orange marmalade cake. And we had the best time. And that was just a one-off. So a book group doesn't have to be something that meets regularly. This was just something that we put together with some staff members. They came to my house. We ate. We talked about the book. And it's rich with characters. And I mean that in quotes and otherwise. There are real characters in this book. And this is a mom-friendly book. If you've got a book group where maybe um, they object to certain themes, there wouldn't be anything, I think, that would be objectionable in this. Yet, I don't think it's worse for the wear for being not as dramatic as Unwind in terms of its mm -hmm. themes. Because it's, there are adult themes in there, certainly. There are. It's everyday life. Yes, and, and, it, and the, mm -hmm. the setting definitely becomes a character, the fictional town of Mitford. Um, uh, and if you're thinking, I've already read this, and I know we have a staff member here. I just asked her yesterday, do you reread read books? And she said, no. Once I've read it, I've read it. So, you know, maybe you've got a lot of people who've read this book, but I think it's worth a revisit because you always pick up something new when you reread a book, and I'm obviously a rereader. So don't let that influence you if that would be a trouble. And just to, uh, Jan Karen has a cookbook. It's owned by 28 libraries in Nebraska, so if you feel you want to get the real recipes, we can ILL that for you. So if food is your thing and character conversations or something, I'd recommend this book. And even though you've read it, take another look at it. And then once you love the characters, there's nine books in the series, and that's always a gem, too. So At Home in Mitford is one of my recommendations. We had a great time eating and talking. <laughs> okay, Deborah. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about one more um, children's book. It's called Code Talker, a novel about the Navajo Marines of World War II. It's by Joseph Bouchak, um, who is actually part Native American, although he is not Navajo. But he did go down to um, Arizona, and he <clears throat> um, met with a number of Navajo people and got their perspective and their basically their permission to write this story. Um, it is a historical novel. He did not write it as a nonfiction book, but it is a novel about um, how Navajo boys were sent to boarding school 
where of course the native language is forbidden, the native dress is forbidden, native culture is forbidden. But when World War II came along, the Marines came calling to say, hey, we need people who know the Navajo language because no, that was a code that, could not, that the Japanese could not mm. break. Okay? So the story follows one main um, character, Ned Begay, um, as he is sent off to boarding school as a child uh, to learn English and be assimilated into American culture. That's a big thing that we talked about how you do assimilate other cultures, how over the centuries, the, you know, the millennium, when one group of people moves into, you know, another area, you know, how do the cultures mix? How does one subsume the other? You know, it happens. Um, we also talked um, about discrimination because um, their culture was being discriminated against. And of course, um, Indians did have problems with alcohol. So, for example, they were barred from a number of um, bars, saloons, <laughs> pubs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, in fact, how even after they served in World War II, they put their lives on the line. They, um, they were patriotic. They, they gave a lot to the war effort. But when they came home, they faced the same discrimination. Um, one thing that I really loved and, and pointed out when we discussed this book is the, um, the, the pace and the rhythm of the story. It's to I could hear an, a Native American storyteller telling this story, mm -hmm. just the rhythm of the words. Mm -hmm. It was really, really, I really enjoyed it. You read it. That. You didn't listen to it. No, I read it, I read but it. I, still, I still got that feel. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, the way it's set up, the um, main character is telling this story to his grandchildren, so you get that storytelling effect. Mm. So, yeah. And I have you read any of the novels of Tony Hillerman? Yes. And there's mm -hmm. they say Navajo people, mm -hmm. and there is something about their their speech and attitude toward life where they they don't talk quickly, quiet, mm -hmm. polite people. I would uh -huh. say, and yeah, you can pick up that. You can, you can hear their speech as you're reading the words. Uh -huh. mm. and so, so that's a great thing for, for um, children to get, students to get. And also, I think this is just another, again, it's a wonderful way to pick up history. Mm -hmm. you know, it reinforces what they're learning in school, possibly about World War II or about um, the treatment of Native Americans. And it's told from the perspective of one of the people who's participating. So, and it hits all of the, you know, the, the big events in the Pacific during mm -hmm. the war. So I really recommend this book. I thought okay. it was great. All right. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, from the serious to the, <laughs> not ridiculous, but very funny. Uh, many of you have probably read Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg. So did you want to? Oh, yeah, I am. I'm yeah. looking at you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and while she's finding that line. spot... Um, Something I didn't mention uh, about All the King's Men is a, a movie, of course, was made of it. So if you can find it on Blockbuster or you're one of those uh, Netflix fans or some other way to get the movie, um, we've done that a few times in our book where we've read the book and also seen the movie. And mm -hmm. I don't necessarily recommend that, but it does make for... You would want everyone to do both. It, I think it doesn't work very well if someone only watches a movie and doesn't also read the book. Mm -hmm. But you, you do... It does add a bit of flavor to the discussion sometimes because you can then kind of critique how the movie maker dealt with the book. <laughs> Not always well. Anyway, uh, Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe has been out for a while too. It's, it's not really old, but it, it was written in 1987 by Fanny Flagg, who's a former actress. And I have not followed up to see if you can find any of the movies or TV shows that she was ever in. But Internet um, movie database. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she's a very good writer. And this one uh, is the story of the inhabitants of Whistle Stop, Alabama, uh, which is close to Birmingham. I doubt if it's a real place. I think she just made it up. And it spans a, a long time period between the 1920s and the 1980s. And the premise of the book is two women who meet in a nursing home, one of them being a middle-aged uh, menopausal, Evelyn Crouch, who's there visiting her mother-in-law. She's 48 years old. And another woman named um, Minnie Threadgood who's 86 years old, and they 
almost accidentally meet one another sort of out in the lobby and then um, they bond and Evelyn when she keeps coming back to visit her mother-in-law always makes a point of, of trying to she's really there to visit Minnie after a while because her mother-in-law is not so much fun to visit but um, it that's how it starts out but the story that's told and it, it does change point of view uh, from from Minnie and Evelyn talking together and Minnie being the narrator and then you get um, as more of an author point of view where you're, you're just getting the story but it's really the story of two women um, who um, almost grow up together. One's named Izzy Threadgood. There's a, a, a very prominent family in town, the Threadgood family. <laughs> and uh, lots of kids. They also have other relatives, extended family kind of come to live with them from time to time. And one of them is a young woman named Ruth Jameson. Mm -hmm. And uh, Izzy and Ruth bond instantly. Ruth is a few years older than Izzy. Izzy is a free spirit who just can't be tamed and just kind of does what she likes. Ruth is a much quieter, beautiful young woman. They really bond, and um, I mean really bond. And I think that is a theme. If you have people in your book group who might have difficulties with a same-sex relationship, um, it's never overt in the book at all, but it's something that's there. And what I found really interesting is everybody in the community knows about it. They, uh, they, have, they eventually do um, team up. Um, uh, without spoiling the story for you, there's a, a bad husband uh, of Ruth's who um, is abusing her and, and uh, he factors into the story. There's an element of mystery relating to that, which I'm not going to tell you any more about, but it, it is <laughs> really interesting. But this book is also funny, very funny. Um, it's got recipes in the back. Lisa was mentioning food. And, and I've included and, a recipe um, here, which you'll yeah. need, you know. Yeah, and th this one, our uh, NLC book group read this a long, long time ago when we were uh, a group with a different Makeup. membership. Lisa was a member of that mm -hmm. group at that time, and we would meet in one another's homes. And this one happened to be at my home, and I, I actually, there are recipes for fried green tomatoes in this book. Um, so if you borrow our copy, you get the recipes and some discussion questions. And I made them. It, we must have met um, in the summertime when I, mm -hmm. my tomatoes were producing green tomatoes, and I, <laughs> I made the recipe. So we did do that in those days. We would, we would make food kind of themed, and, mm -hmm. which Lisa still does with her group. So that adds just an element of fun. But if you're looking something that, for something that's not too taxing, it's a pretty short read. There are elements of sadness in it. There's a lot of, of humor, as I said, and um, it does jump back forth in, t in time. I've also seen the movie, and um, Kathy Bates played the <laughs> role of Evelyn, the, the menopausal, rather overweight uh, person, and Jessica Tandy played Nini Threadgood, so uh, both stellar actors to portray those people. So I, I would highly recommend it, especially, uh, you know, our book group, we sometimes for the summer, we pick, we have kind of our trashy read. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, it's not trash at all, but it's just fun and, and not too taxing, but still plenty to discuss. Um, lots of themes about how women were treated, how they were mm. accepted or not under those circumstances. Um, just It takes place during the Depression, a lot of it during the Depression. So you have the hobos who would come to the back of the restaurant to get food. So these women would, would help anyone. They were frowned upon by some people. And uh, they also employed black people and would serve them food and so on, which was something you didn't do in Alabama in the 20s. So there's, there's lots of other themes that could be discussed as well as just enjoying a good read. And I think worth a reread. Uh, I'll yeah, I reread it for this. I'll, I, I'll be an advocate for rereading. It. Yeah, I do it a lot. Yes. Good. Yeah, <laughs> I, and, and I know there are those of you out there who don't, but, um, you know, maybe give one a try again. And we have quite a few copies, I think. So. Yeah, oops. Yeah, we had, I think, oops. Oh, shoot. Never mind. Okay. Yes. We have 10 copies of fried oh, green okay. tomatoes. Okay. And you probably have some more in your, your own collection, so you could add those. Okay, I'm going to change the mood way a lot here. We, um, you're familiar with Stieg Larsson, the Swedish author who just blew the mystery reader world apart with his Millennium Trilogy, and we've got all three of them. And because I'm a series reader, I insist you read them in order. Um. 
<laughs> you can't not read these. You can't not they read these. You really, really do have to read them yeah. in order. Um, clearly, we have the most of the first, not as much as the second, and then only a single copy of the third. So if you do get hooked, we've got them all. And there are some people who say, I'm not going to read a book while it's hot. So here's your chance. Now the, the excitement has died down. And the person who picked this from my book group was very anxious. She said, you know, it, it is a genre book. It's a mystery book. And I said, but I think it's a lot more than that. And we had a really excellent discussion about this. Some people had already read it. I reread it for the book group. And it is written by a gentleman who died in 2004 who was a journalist. And the main character in the book is a journalist. So you, you can't help but seeing some autobiographical elements in the book. It's unfortunate because he was wildly popular and now this is all there's going to be. So um, that is difficult. But well, there is another book that there's litigation there's, over yeah. who's going to make the money. Yeah, and all these books were published posthumously as well. Um, obviously, there's two main characters. Elizabeth Salander is a character who will stay with you forever. She is heavily tattooed and is the girl with the dragon tattoo, obviously. And um, I, I have seen both the Swedish and the American movies. You, you've got two options in, in this one if you want to watch movies. And I can't help seeing the Swedish actress who portrayed it now because she was so compelling and such a wonderful actress. I do see her now as I'm rereading this. But it is violent. It is sexually explicit. Certainly the scenes of violence are disturbing and difficult. So um, something to consider. My group reads tough, gritty novels all the time, so this wasn't anything that put anybody off. And one of the English professors in our group talked about the symbolism of the tattoos and how that was very warrior-esque and that Elizabeth was really a warrior and brought out literary elements of quite serious <laughs> I thought, this is just a mystery. But we had a really compelling discussion about this, and I think that's the beauty of a book group. You're reading a book for fun, for pleasure, and this certainly would fall into that category because it's a mystery. And a lot of everyone in my book group is a mystery reader, and so that's why it felt like we were cheating. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we really brought out a lot of um, elements that I would never have caught on my own. And so to bring out a book that... I would consider trash or entertainment. Oops. I would just consider that talking about a book is really really enhances it. And this would be one I would recommend for a book group. If your book group can tolerate the very, very graphic and violent themes in this book. And then you get hooked and you can pick the second and the third. And so for those of you who skipped it when it was hot, here it is. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Well, and they, it is, they are page turners. I'd almost call them combination thriller mysteries mm. because there's just so much going on. There's many themes. There's yeah. lots of themes. Yeah. And the other thing that I really appreciated was the European sensibility of relationships in this book. The Americans can be a little jolted by. There are casual sexual relationships outside of marriage in this book. And how that's really nothing to a European sensibility. Perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. No, none of the characters is living a happy family life. Mm -mm. And yet, I, I see that in many of the Scandinavian mysteries that I've Yet, yet you still read. cheer for these characters. Elizabeth will stay with me for the rest of my life. And yes. I think that's, they're memorable. Yeah. One theme that um, occur, it is, is just the way, how Elizabeth grew up, which... Mm -hmm may come to explain why she is the way she is to a large extent. Yeah, and I'm currently does. listening to one called The Orchardist. It's a new book, which also has a young woman in it who has been terribly abused as a child mm. and becomes a very interesting person as an adult. So, there's yeah, there, there are more serious themes. It's not just a thriller. Yeah. It's not just for the... Sex and violence. <laughs> and his trilogy has sold more than 20 million copies in 41 countries. So this isn't a flash in the pan. It, it's not serious literature. It's not going to win a Pulitzer. But if you have mystery readers, here's a dark side option. Well, my husband and I listened to them, and I have to tell this story. I'll do it fast. We were driving uh, on a road trip to, to visit family um, 
and we got almost to the end of the second book and we were nearly at our destination and we started driving around <laughs> because we couldn't we didn't want to get to my sister's house before we finished listening to book two <laughs> yeah and then you have movie combinations here too obviously you've got three swedish movies for all of these and just the american version for the first but boy there's lots of compare and contrast there as well Except you can't put your hands over your eyes in the Swedish version because I had to read the subtitles. Exactly. So. You have to see it all. I knew it was going to happen. Okay. Deborah, what have you got next? Okay. Um, the next book um, is Molokai. And actually, this wasn't read, read by um, our group, but it was a, um, a runner-up for the One Book, One Lincoln here a few years ago. And I've talked about this book with a number of different people. Um, the novel follows a Hawaiian girl who comes down with leprosy when she is only seven years old. And she is banished. She's actually arrested and banished in 1892 to um, a segregated community on the island of Molokai. And she lived there for over 50 years until she was cured and paroled because she had been arrested, so she had to be paroled. Um, it follows her um, her life there. You know, she arrives as a seven-year-old. They do have something of a school there. Um, the book lets you in bit by bit on how a community works. They're cut off from the world, but you've got all different kinds of people here. Mm -hmm. You have people who here who are sent. There's a young man just out of college, diagnosed with leprosy, off to this you know, community, uh, colony he, that he sent. Older people, her uncle is sent there. The book really talks about how people can adjust to that type of world. You know, if you're just uh, one day, hey, your life ends and you're sent off to this other community, can you, can you create a new life for yourself or not? Some people can't handle it. And mm -hmm. there are suicides, there are other things that go on. But you have, um, um, you ha they, they create basically a town. So they have a post office, they have a store, they do work if they want to, if they, if they can. So you get, you know, that sense of community, how people, you know, that are just thrown together just on the basis of sharing a, the same disease, how they manage to create a life for themselves. Can they, you know, form relationships? Can they, you know, survive together? Um, it talks a lot about, um, it shows how there are selfless people. You know, there was a religious community that did set up the hospital there and, and take care of the people. There were people who worked to find a cure for this disease. Um, there, and then, of course, the government plays a big part in this. Okay, the government is the, the entity that the people who make up the government <laughs> is the entity that has sent the people there, that's keeping the people there, that is supposed to be supporting the people, but is not really spending all that much money on them. And as I've discussed this with people, with people you know, I think back to working at the After State Developmental mm -hmm. Center, where back in the 70s, uh, early, late 60s, early 70s, an Omaha television station did a documentary and found that um, actually at VSDC they were the state was spending less money per person than was being spent per animal at the Henry Dorley Zoo. <sighs> they raised their own food, they did a lot of sewing of their own clothes, and you know, all these things happened at VSDC too, you know. Mm -hmm. However, um, Again, the government stepped in, the, um, the Rachel, the protagonist, finds love, has a child, government says, eh, that child's going to get leprosy if it stays there. They forced her to give the child up for adoption. You know, how do you live with that? Lots and lots of things to talk about. Very sad things, but you know, she survived. She overcomes so much, and eventually she is paroled. What happened to her family? This disease broke up a lot of families, created a lot of tensions, blame, guilt. What happens to those who are left behind? What happens if 
a mother loses one child, you know, has a child arrested because of leprosy, and is afraid that another child might have it, what do you do? Do you stick around for the police to arrest the next one, the inspectors to arrest the next one, or do you take off and hide that child? Lots of things to talk about. Sadness, but some joy too. Wow. And history. Okay. All right, Beth. Well, I could say, and now for something completely different, and that's because it's hard to even <laughs> tell people what this book is about. I want, I want to talk about Life of Pi by mm -hmm. Anne Martell, Good luck. who's a, <laughs> a Canadian author. And um, the, the basic premise of the book is a, a young teenage boy, 16-year-old boy, who grows up in India uh, up to that age. He and his parents and brother are, well, the family has a zoo. And they have to sell this. Basically, they're go they decide to immigrate to Canada. And they're on a ship, a Japanese uh, freighter, with all the animals. Big storm comes along, ship sinks. Um, Pi uh, ends up in a lifeboat with some of the zoo animals, most prominently a Bengal tiger named Richard Parker. <laughs> so how do you describe this book? If, if you haven't heard about it before, it was another one that, that when we got the kit book on it here, I hadn't read it, so I suggested that our book group read it. Read it. Um, and you may have uh, found out that, that there's a movie showing in theaters right now. The movie about it just came out. And I have to say, without having told you anything more about the book, that I think the, uh, the, um, the producer of the movie, Ang Lee, has done a pretty good job of portraying the spirit of the book. This book is a spiritual journey. It's, um, again, it's, it's the adult pie. So they tell you right at the beginning, this story has a quote unquote happy ending. Uh, he survives that, that voyage on the lifeboat with the tiger. Um, and the author, uh, it's one of these where the, there's a preface where the author, who is obviously Jan, Jan Martell, it is fiction of course, um, says here's an author who's sort of between books. His last book fizzled and died. He's looking for ideas. He goes to India meets up with someone who, who knew the family and says, if you want to write a good book or, and hear a story that will make you believe in God, go back to Canada, go to uh, Montreal and visit this, this man, Pi. So that's how it gets started. And then this, the rest of the book is Pi telling the story. And there are actually some elements of humor in it, particularly at the beginning about his real name is Tassin. His parents named him for a swimming pool. That's the French, he was in a, it, there was a small French colony in India, and that's where he grew up, Pondicherry, and I'm probably not saying that correctly, but he had, so he's, you have the typical thing of a child getting sent to school with a name like Piscine. Well, what do you think the kids call him? It's the pissing boy, so <laughs> he, and, and how he, he manages to take charge of his own name and get people to start calling him Pi, which he relates to the mathematical sign for Pi. Um, this boy embraces religion at a young age, and not just one. So there's some humor about how he learns while still living in India about four different religions. Uh, he was, of course, born Hindu. Well, no, I shouldn't say of course. Hindu, he embraces uh, Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism, all unbeknownst to his parents. So there are some <laughs> funny moments where the clerics all discover one another, that they're sort of competing for this boy, and also the parents find out what's been going on. So um, then moving into the bulk of the story is, this, is uh, in, in some detail, and I found this part somewhat pretty believable, actually, about how one winds up on a, a lifeboat that's large enough that you can imagine someone surviving on it. There are supplies on the boat. But just how he, he manages to live with this Bengal tiger. And there is a uh, rather violent episode earlier on where Pai's father uh, shows him why he should never trust the tiger. Don't ever believe that this tiger is ever going mm. to be your friend. This is when they're still back at the zoo. And he has to remember that. And just how he deals with being with the tiger. But of course the whole thing is really a metaphor for a spiritual journey. And you know, without again giving away too much, there are really two possible stories as to what happened on that lifeboat. And um, uh, it's it's if you any either of you have read it, please jump in and, and give your views on it. I, I recommend great. it. I recommend it, but it's really hard to it was tell somebody discussion. what this book is about. It was an odd discussion in my group, and I scratched my head trying to remember how it even went because I couldn't read it for much. Well, it's a parable. 
It really is. Yes. I mean, even the characters. Who is the tiger really? So if who you is, have literal yeah. readers in your group, they're going to get it's very about, upset about. Oh this. yes. Oh yes. I mean, you, you're not meant to believe that something like this could ever right. happen, but but you're meant to think about what it all represents in a spiritual way. You'll have very contrasting mm -hmm. opinions in your group on this. I do believe. I'm going to move along. So we've we've got a lot of books to get through. If you're interested in reading a Nebraska author, and you all might recall that Mary Piper was at an NLA keynote speaker uh, a couple years ago, three, four years ago in Grand Island, um, you'll notice that I've got a Nebraska mark. So if it's got a setting or a Nebraska author, I will try to make note of that. This book was chosen as a nonfiction non selection for our book group. And the reason I want to highlight this is because um, we had so many people in my book group who recognized the schools or the people, and it really enhanced the discussion. And you very well, no matter where you live, may know some of the folks or the circumstances. Lincoln is a refugee relocation center, and Mary brings to light her role that she creates for herself as a cultural broker. For example, all the credit card things that come in the mail to you to fill out. A person from a different culture wouldn't necessarily understand the concept of junk mail. That was one example that she brought up in the book, and teaching young refugees to drive when uh, they're out of their element. Um, I, I think it adds an element to have an opportunity to see the author, and she certainly does enough uh, appearances. She's often been at the book festival, um, another book that she wrote that was autobiographical. We also read another of her book and revealed a lot about herself. And then people would say, I especially like this, the story that you told. And she said, well, how do you know that? What well, you wrote about it. <laughs> so she has, she's a revealing person. I, I really endlessly like hearing her. And so um, she's written lots of books. This one enlightened me to cultural sensitivity in a way that I think I would never have learned except for reading it from Mary. Now, you may not live in a cultural of diverse community, but we certainly do here in Lincoln and have lots of languages and lots of cultures here. And this was a real eye-opener, and certainly we had some great discussions. It was life-changing to me in a way to awaken me. I didn't volunteer for anything, but I became more aware. So um, if you're looking for a nonfiction title, this is not going to be, um, this is going to be very enlightening, I think, for your group. The next one I'm going to talk about is the number one ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Oop. And I'm going light <laughs> this time. Um, it is a mystery. You have your detective. Um, but it's a lot more than that. Um, Precious Ramatswe is the person who starts the detective agency in Botswana. And really, okay, she's starting a new life. Mm. She's she's starting a new life because her father has died. She's divorced. She's you know a lot of things going on. So she's moving to a new town. She's just becoming a detective. So there's just that newness, okay? But there's also the oldness. She brings along all the wise sayings from her father. She um, relies very heavily upon a book written by um, a gentleman on how to be a detect private detective. Um, but she just solves so many problems through common sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very nice, you know, light introduction to the people and customs of Botswana. Mm -hmm. um, I really recommend that you listen to the audio version <laughs> <Me too. laughs> to get the pronunciations of a lot of the names and the courtesy titles that they call each other. Mm -hmm. It's not Mr. and Mrs. It's mama. for women. It's yeah. Mama. Mm -hmm. There's two M's and an A, and for men, it's two R's and an wow. A. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yes. So you roll those R's mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can. Um, so there's a lot of information about traditions, the courtes courtesies that they mm -hmm. show each other. Um, the interactions um, between people and how it, you can talk about how it affects the pace of the book. It mm -hmm. is, you know, it's slow. a very slow paced book. So mm -hmm. if people like that, they'll really enjoy these. Um, and I've also had discussions with people on how 
uh, it compares to the TV series that was done of this particular book. And I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the TV series. I did too. Yeah, I saw so, them too. So, I'll let you move and on. And that is the first in a series. Yes. And I have had a discussion with someone who said, skip the first, get right to the second. Oh. She didn't like the first, so. Yeah. But then the I'm. The first one it gives you a lot of the background story. I think story it sets the tone. Yeah. It sets yeah. the tone. Yeah. Yeah. So read the first, but that's me. And her gentleman <laughs> admirer, are they ever going yes. to get married? And yes. yes. That's a continuing theme. Yes. Okay, Beth, what have you Okay, uh, I have one nonfiction book. Again, it's not brand new, but it's called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. And Deborah actually recommended this. Um, for our NLC book group some years back, uh, came out in, in 2004, and she can probably tell as much as I can about it. I just found this one of the best books I've ever read. It's very inspiring. It's about a real person, of course, Dr. Paul Farmer, who grew up in a, I think, fairly unconventional, but, but rather privileged family. They were able to send him to, I think it was Harvard, to become a doctor. And, um, but he, he doesn't go the traditional route. He decides <laughs> that he's going to devote his life to helping um, helping out with, with the health of people in countries that are not as privileged as ours. Haiti uh, is the one that's really featured most prominently in this book. So, And Tracy Kidder, the author, he has written other books, and mm -hmm. he's a very gifted writer. And so it's, it's, the, Tracy, it's also the story of Tracy going and being with Paul, following him around to some extent as he, as he does his work in Haiti. Um, I don't think either the biographer or Paul Farmer are big fans of U.S. foreign policy when it comes to countries like Haiti mm -hmm. or Cuba and, and their medical problems. Um, there's an element of that in it. Um, now, I didn't take a lot of notes on this, but I just, I just remember it being, just coming away thinking, wow, this is one of the best books I've ever read. So, Deborah, please jump in. Oh, please jump in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we did have a good discussion on it. Yeah. There were some people who were really interested in how he managed to get around. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, the way he's, ways he'd the, get money. Yes. And the he, funding and stuff. He still and, had a cross appointment uh -huh. at Harvard, and I think he would yeah. almost hold them hostage. hostage. Like, I won't work mm -hmm. for you anymore unless you may, you allow yes. me to go off and spend half of the year doing these other things. Right, and, and how he got equipment and medicine and... Um, yeah, Paul is not a play well with others kind of guy. There's uh -huh. also stuff about his own personal life mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, the women in his life and so on that he is so focused, um, mm -hmm. obsessed mm -hmm. with Trust. his with his mm -hmm. life um, that it would be very difficult to be a romantic partner or a spouse of someone like him. It catalogs as a 610, which is a perfect segue to my oh, next title. Right. Have, I, have I slowed you down any? Nope. Okay, excellent. Um, my book group had one of those we all loved it discussions about this book, My Own Country, by Abraham Burgess, who was the writer of Cutting for Stone, the one book, one Lincoln, last year. And many of you have read that. I preferred this book, although they make nice companion reads. Um, our mental health director in my book group chose this. He's been curious about Indian Indian people. Or this is actually an Ethiopian. He is Indian, Abraham Burgess, born in Ethiopia. Born, Born in, in India, India in a Christian, to Indian parents. Christian part of India. Yes. Anyway, um, he went to the write, Iowa Writers Workshop and is a physician. So he this also catalogs, I believe, is a medical book. And certainly nothing that would come to my attention unless someone in my book group would have picked it. We loved him. We loved his ethics. We loved. We were in. We were just passionate about how he treated the early AIDS epidemic. Uh, epidemic. He was in a southern hospital in Tennessee. So not only were they working against a lot of difficulty about homosexuality and what AIDS was, he was the sort of he is the sort of doctor you would want for your own self. And he has um, I put a TED video on here where you can see him talking. And once you've read this book and discussed it, you will want to see him and hear what he has to say. We gushed like you gushed over this. So um, if you've read Cutting for Stone, this is an excellent companion book. Don't let it slip by. We had an excellent discussion. Okay. Well, I'm finishing up with another um, nonfiction book. It's called In a Sunburned Country by Bill Bryson. <laughs> I've read this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you want, if you like 
<coughs> nonfiction that's writ written tongue in cheek or with a really good sense of humor. Read Bill Bryson. Read anything <laughs> by Bill Bryson. Mm -hmm. um, this particular one is basically a travelogue of Australia, but it's the off the beaten path, not necessarily where most tourists would get to. Um, he does give you background history, but then he also tells you about the people he meets. He tells you, you know, talks about um, uh, his adventures. Um, definitely, definitely tongue-in-cheek. Um, uh, Australia is a very uh, uh, challenging country, what with all of its uh, extremes and animals. climate and poisonous <laughs> Everything's animals poisonous. or dangerous <laughs> animals, yes. Um, but we had fun. Actually, for, for that particular discussion, um, we read, we each read a different book by Bill Bryson. Oh. Or several of us read different books, not all the same book. Um, we did all read one of his, um, a short history of nearly, life, everything. Of nearly yeah. everything together. So I'm going to in, insert, some of you call and you're looking for a light book. We just uh -huh. finished a heavy book. This would be a light book. Mm -hmm. You'll laugh out loud. Yeah. Okay, let's wrap up. Finding here. new? Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Up? Yeah, go ahead. It's not a light book. It's a mystery. It's fairly new. Um, lots of cultural stuff to talk about about role of women in Saudi Arabia. So check it out. And lastly, um, wow. I have Sand Hills Ballad, and you may have heard about this author, Ledette Randolph. I know we don't have very many copies of this, but. Um, for those, we, we were really critical, my book group, about how she treated the sand hills and if she was accurate, because everybody in my book group had a connection to the sand hills. I knew if she was making up something, but she had spent a lot of time with her grandparents in the sand hills, and she did quite well. The interesting aspect of this book discussion was I didn't like any of the characters, and one of my book members invited her to the discussion. So we had the author right there in the room with us, and all I wanted to do was say, I hated every character that you created. I didn't like them, and she was okay with that. <laughs> it was a really interesting thing to tell the author what she thought of her book in a book club. Uh, so this has a Nebraska affiliation, obviously. Um, if you're a book festival person, Ledette um, often frequents there, so if you like to meet the author, you would have opportunity to do so. There you go. I think we we're just a couple minutes before. Any yeah, questions or any questions, comments, thoughts on any of the books? You can type it into your uh, go to webinar questions section of your interface. Nothing came in during the session. Okay. Everyone just sat and listened. Okay. <laughs> Taking notes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just throw in. Lisa mentioned she with series. She always says you have to read the first one first. We had this discussion in one of our book group meetings on mm -hmm. whether you should read everything in order or not. And a few of us did say, you know, if we had read the very first book in this series, we would not have read any of the others. Oh, yeah. However, <laughs> we I, came in on book number four, and we loved it. So we went back to the first one and started reading from There the was beginning. one that, mm -hmm. that we read long ago called Miss Sukas and the Library Murders, which I just, they just hated it. And I have not gone back. Oh, mm -hmm. I keep, people keep telling me how much I've read better that too. Yeah. Uh, well, subsequent books are. So. We had someone okay. pick the fourth book in a series of a James Patterson oh. series. Pick the fourth. And I mm -hmm. said, you made me read four books. <laughs> 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 she looked at me as though I know I didn't. And I had yes. to read the first three. Yes. <laughs> well, don't try it with Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. You absolutely yes, have to read Yes, you do have to read those in order. Well, I think it can depend on the series and hopefully if yeah. someone's recommending the fourth they should know you don't have to read the first three to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for someone like you who doesn't care if they tell you that, <laughs> that's going to be an issue. Yes. I know. We have people who won't reread, people who have to read in order, um, people who have to finish a book. Yeah. Beth is a reformed, has to finish a book. Yeah. She I, quits well, I'm a reformed. I used to be the champion. I had actually read to the end every book she that finished we discussed, everything. and now I'm terrible. She's a quitter. <laughs> Um, well, if you're not enjoying it, do you have yeah. to put yourself through the pain? Yeah. Well, yeah. one of my sisters-in-law is an avid reader. I mean, she's, she's like our Sally. She has a house filled with books. She will collect an entire series before and wait till it's over before she will begin reading so that oh, she can read them boy, all, boy. you know, just sort of hibernate for a week and read all mm -hmm. five or all six or whatever. 
Well, we are passionate about book clubs. <laughs> Call us if you need help um, picking anything. We will do our best to help you and be in touch with us. And by all means, uh, avail yourself to our ever-growing collection. And thank you for your morning. Yeah, we do just have a couple of comments. Excellent, ladies. I've enjoyed this from Susie Dunn. Oh, thank and you. Uh, Laura Hassan Stanton says, there are so many good books to choose from. I hope I can get a book discussion group started in Stanton. Okay. It's well, simple. And um, we have a Encompass Live where we talked about how to start a book group. Yes. Look and back at our, our, our recordings, yeah. So, um, or call us. Call us. Because uh, really we all have some tips and tricks that will help. Yeah. And ours started out pretty freewheeling, but it's now we at least attempt to alternate fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And we go round robin. It's who gets to pick what the next read is going to yeah. be. Mm -hmm. And, and that, in some book groups, the librarian helpful. picks. So there's yeah. no right or wrong, but we would be happy to share with you some opinions if you want to get started. Thank okay. you. All right, great. Thank, Thank you very much, guys. Um, if you would just uh, search oh. Encompass Live. We can bring up the website. Oh, yes. It'll come up when you just do the first two. So, um, oh, wait, we do have a comment from Susie. I read oh. Sand Hills Ballad last winter and gave it as a gift. Although I'm not from the Sand Hills, my spouse is, and at the time I did wonder about the authenticity. The way the book j jumped bugged me once in a while, but all in all, a good read. It jumped around, I guess. The... Mm, I just hated the characters. <laughs> I hated them all. And that ruins it for me. Mm, if I can, if I that is difficult to, yeah. yeah. Okay. If you're not enjoying yourself, absolutely. <laughs> Okay. That okay. was the page yeah. you wanted? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, as I said, this was recorded, and when we put up the recording, the link to the Book Club Kits um, page will be there as well. Um, we also have in our delicious account, it's like a link to the wiki, the sharing wiki. Does that Good. still get used yes. by yes, people? Okay. There's a wiki out there for libraries to share information about doing Book Club Kits and mm -hmm. kits that they might have outside of the books. So that will be out there as well for you to get more um, uh, information about doing this. Yeah. Great. So thank you very much for attending this week. I hope you'll join us next week when we're actually going to be uh, learning about Access Nebraska as opposed to Nebraska Access. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Access Nebraska is the Department of Health and Human Services website. And um, we are bringing in uh, Stacy Shank, who's from there. She's going to be remoting in to talk to us and go over their new website. They've actually, I guess, redesigned it recently. So we're going to see all the kind of resources you can find on there to help your parents get information and help from um, Health and Human Services. So sign up for that. Join us next week to learn about Access Nebraska. And if you are a Facebook user, we are on, in addition to having our web page, Friend Compass Live, where you can find out all, all our shows, we have a, um, a Facebook page as well. So um, if you go here and like our Facebook page, you'll see not get notifications here of upcoming shows, uh, when recordings are available, reminders that, as I did this morning, join us right now to join into whatever show we happen to have um, going on now. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.